So welcome to Desford Interest Group online via YouTube. We would love you to be able to be here in person, but if you're watching later, do enjoy these TED Talks. They're part of a series that we're doing throughout the year, once a month, that we meet at the moment online, but soon in person at Desford Free Church. Each of the talks tonight have been selected by a member of the group and we've tried to cover different aspects of hopelessness. So if you like what you hear, do come and join us, I uh, guess, online or in person at the Free Church. Uh, I will see you soon. Thank you. Two years ago, I stood on the TED stage in Arusha, Tanzania. I spoke very briefly about one of my proudest creation. It was a simple machine that changed my life. Before that time, I had never been away from my home in Malawi. I had never used the computer. I had never seen an internet. On stage that day, I was so nervous. My English lost. <laughs> I wanted to vomit. <laughs> I had never been surrounded by so many Azungu, white people. <laughs> there was a story I couldn't tell you then. But well, I'm feeling good right now. I'd like to share that story today. We are seven children in my family, all sisters excepting me. <laughs> this is me with my dad when I was a little boy. Before I discovered the wonders of science, I was just a simple farmer in a country of poor farmers. Like everyone else, we grew maize. One year, our fortune turned very bad. In 2001, we experienced an awful famine. Within five months, all Malawians began to starve to death. My family ate one meal per day at night, only three swallows of simmer for each one of us. The food passes through our bodies. We drop down to nothing. In Malawi, secondary school, you have to pay school fees. Because of the hunger, I was forced to drop out of school. I looked at my father and looked at those dry fields. It was the future I couldn't accept. I feel very happy to be at the first year of secondary school. So I was determined to do anything possible to receive education. So I went to a library. I learned books, science books, especially physics. I couldn't read English that well. I used diagrams and pictures to learn the words around them. Another book put that knowledge in my hands. It said, windmill could pump water and generate electricity. Pump water meant irrigation, a defense against hunger, which were experiencing by that time. So I decided I would build one windmill for myself. But I didn't have materials to use. So I went to a scrapyard where I found my materials. Many people, including my mother, said I was crazy. <laughs> I found a tractor fan, shock absorber, PVC pipes, using a bicycle frame, and the old bicycle dynamo, I built my machine. It was one light at first, and then four lights with switches, and even a circuit breaker modeled after an electric bell. Another machine pumps water 
for irrigation. Queues of people start lining up at my house <laughs> to charge their mobile phone. I could not get rid of them. <laughs> and the reporters came too, which led to bloggers, and which led to a call from something called Ted. I had never seen an aeroplane before. I had never slept in a hotel. So on stage that day in Arusha, my English lost. I said something like, I tried and I made it. So I would like to say something to all the people out there, like me, to the Africans and the poor who are struggling with your dreams. God bless. Maybe one day you watch this on the internet. I said to you, trust yourself and believe. Whatever happened, don't give it up. Thank you. So that was the, the first, uh, and obviously dealing with, um, well, a, a hopeless situation in, in a way, and uh, I'm sure we're all impressed with that. We're going to move on to the, the second talk, and Jim's not with us yet, so we'll do uh, do mine, which is by a guy called uh, Nick Vujicic. Uh He's an Australian. Uh, it's a name that uh, you may or may not know, just to give it some context, um, he's a very he's an inspirational sort of chap. Uh, Eileen, my wife, used to use uh, some videos of him speaking to young people in particular. Uh, it will become very very obvious if you haven't seen him. It will be very obvious when you see him what uh, what he's he's talking about. But somebody who's overcome immense difficulties. So we'll go back to sharing. First of all, I'll mute myself and then we'll go back to sharing. Um, guys, my name is Nick Vujicic. I was born in Australia in 1982, moved from Australia to California in the year 2006. And uh, my life story, um, I'm just thankful that people has, have, have seen my life on some sort of level, whether it's just YouTube videos or seeing uh, pictures of a limbless guy smile. Um, you know, people always ask me, you know, what happened to you and, and how did you overcome uh, what you've been through? Um, the title of the message that I've been given is uh, transforming the walls into doors. Uh, when I speak corporately, um, the line that I like to use is changing obstacles into opportunities. Now, I'm very well aware to, to share with you as well. I know that there are a billion people going hungry today. I know that this year, a million people will commit suicide. It's one every 40 seconds. I know today there are 120 million slaves and I've met sex slaves, and I've seen the top of the pyramid as far as business and met the billionaires. I've met bankers, and I've also met orphans. We're all looking for something. We're all looking for hope. Hope you can't just have just because you were born with hope. No, we're born with pain. We're born and live through difficulties. And in our life, my parents always taught me 
that even though we don't know why I was born this way, that we have a choice. Either to be angry for what we don't have or be thankful for what we do have. The power of that choice was the first thing that I had to overcome and decide for myself, especially in the early years of school. A lot of kids would come up to me and tease me. And I've been speaking at five congresses. I've met seven presidents all around the world. My largest crowd was 110,000. I have 30,000 invitations for me to speak. So wherever I go, I talk about the value of life. I talk about anti-bullying messages for the school systems in different nations. The greatest thing is love. When we feel like we don't have enough love and we don't have enough hope, we start losing strength to live. For me, in my life as a child, I had a big wall. I was surrounded by four walls and a low ceiling of opportunity. I was set free in so many different ways and especially surviving from day to day with my parents who loved me, who encouraged me, who told me that I was beautiful the way that I was and not to worry about what other people said about me. I was actually the first special needs child to be integrated into the mainstream education system in Australia and I was awarded Young Citizen of the Year in 1990. And the world is a hurting place and the world needs hope and the world needs love. Without hope, we feel like, why are we here? Well, brokenness. Here's mine. Today, I still have no arms, no legs. But everything's changed. Everything. For me, I was looking for hope and happiness, and I couldn't see it for many years. In fact, if this side of the table represents my hope, Truth encourages me to become all that I can be. But then we have lies every day coming in our mind, people who discourage us. You know the people that you have in your life who, no matter how good of a day you're having, they'll bring you down. Or no matter how bad of a day you're having, they'll bring you even lower. You know what I'm talking about? Think of the three biggest discouragers in your life. They're not your biggest discouragers. You are. You are. It only takes three seconds for me to tell you something discouraging. But then you may never forget my words. I've met so many 50-year-old women and 40-year-old women who still remember what their fathers told them that they wish they never heard. Words are powerful. When you hear those words and then your mind starts growing with these lies... Nick, you're not good enough. Nick, just give up. Nick, you're never going to get a job. You won't get married. You can't even hold your wife's hand. What kind of a father are you going to be if you can't even pick up your kids when they're crying? You're alone. Sure, your parents hug you, but their hugs can't heal you. Just give up. 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 At age eight, I thought that I should commit suicide. Why? Because I didn't have hope. I thought I didn't have hope. Today, you can see that I had hope. What's the word? Believing in something you do not see. Faith. Words can only do so much. Hugs can do much more than words. But when hugs can't do anything, that's where faith kicks in. For me, words and hugs were not enough but I had no faith. So I tried to give up. At age 10, I tried to drown myself in six inches or 15 centimeters of water in my home. I told my dad I just wanted to relax, but really, I wanted to end my life. I had enough. Dos de mi abio. Okay. The first two times I rolled over, I was trying to work out how much air I hold in my lungs before I let it out. And the third time, in my mind, knowing that I wanted to get out of here because of the bullying in my life, because I was going to be a burden to my parents and I had nothing to look forward to, I realized at that moment that if I actually went through with committing suicide, I would leave a greater burden for my parents than they already had. So there was one thing less, sorry, there was one thing um, less hopeful or, or more burdensome than having a child without limbs. 
What is it? A child without limbs who gives up. So when I saw in my mind my mom and my dad and my brother crying at my grave if I went through with it, that one thought saved me. If my parents never told me that I was beautiful the way that I was, if my parents never told me that I was special and that I was loved, I wouldn't be here today. So I encourage every single parent who tries their best to encourage their teenagers, especially in the West. Many teenagers put a do not disturb sign on their door. I'm sure, you know, the conversations all around the world between a parent and a teenager. How was school? Fine. What did you learn? Nothing. Did you do your homework? No. And that's the conversation for the day. And when you try to tell your children that they're beautiful, so of course I'm beautiful. I'm your son. I'm your daughter. Of course you're going to say that. But they're right. Every single human being has value and my value is not determined on how I look or what job I have or where I'm from, where I was born, how much money, all that stuff, nothing. So many teenagers, you know, tease each other for how we look and I tell the teenagers, do you think that I'm cool enough to be your friend? They're like, yeah, of course. I said, but I have no arms, no legs. And they said, doesn't matter. I said, really? So it doesn't matter that I have no arms, no legs? I said, no, it doesn't matter. I said, then actually, if it doesn't matter, then why do we kill each other with our words if it actually doesn't matter? Why do we look ourselves in the mirror and see ugly instead of valuable? I want to ask you today, what are you looking for? If I gave you a billion dollars, would you be happy? If you gave me a billion dollars, I'd be very happy. But then if my mom dies tonight, Am I happy? No. With all the money in the world, I'll never be happy. Why? Because money is something that cannot heal the soul. So many teenagers are looking for love, which love does heal the soul. Love does complete the soul. But even sex before marriage, I, am a, I was a virgin before I got married. Yeah, I've, I've got a gorgeous wife. We're pregnant with our first son. And I don't need hands to hold her hand. I, I only want to hold her heart. And, you know, how am I going to hug my kids? So many kids, they come up to me. It's amazing. They put their hands behind their back and hug me with their neck. And I've realized in life, even the worst parts of my life can be turned into good. And they're even more special. So many teenagers, they're looking for love. So they're going to go do this and go do that and have sex before marriage. For me, sex out of marriage is like a $5 Gucci watch. Sex within marriage and having sex with someone who loves you, who's committed to you for the rest of your life, going to be the mother or father of your kids. That's what love is. You can talk, you can sleep with as many people as you like, but never know for sure, do they love me? Love is a lifelong commitment. You see, there are choices in life. And we're looking, I want to ask you, what are you looking for? Well, if I can just get drunk, why not, man? I only live once. Well, if that's the way you believe, great. But for me, I'm a greedy man. I don't want to live for 90 years. I want to live for billions of years. And I know that every day my choices will affect this life, other people's life, and my eternal life. You've got to come to the truth of knowing who you are and why you're here. William Barclay, he said, the greatest two days in anyone's life, the day you were born, and the day you knew why. So, oh, you're ugly. No, I'm beautiful the way that I am. And if you can't believe that for yourself, so many girls especially stay with their emotionally abusive boyfriends. Because if I break up with him, then who's going to want me? See, we all, we, we all want love. That's why we do what we do sometimes to get into the crowd I'm going to swear I'm going to be cool that's what this world is I want to look like her I want to look, if I was taller shorter smarter more popular whatever you want it's not enough until you find the truth I'm wonderfully and fearfully made there's a greater purpose for my life I am here for a reason sure I didn't get a miracle yeah I believe in a God who can do miracles and I have a pair of shoes in my closet. Why? I've seen blind people seeing and deaf people hearing. That's fine if you don't believe me. I got it on camera. But I realized something. If God doesn't change my circumstance, He's going to use my life to be a miracle for someone else. When you don't get a miracle, you can still be a miracle for someone else. 
I'm going to close off with this beautiful story. I was in Southern California. I have two organizations. I have a nonprofit organization and I have a for-profit. I probably spoke between years 2007 and 2010, 1,000 times, 600 flights. And I've spoken to 4.5 million people face-to-face. In the last 48 hours here in Serbia, we've reached 5 million through media. So we have the heart of people to love others. We want people to love each other, love yourself, dream big, and never give up. We're all looking for hope, aren't we? What are you looking for? Money, drug, sex, alcohol, pornography, fame, fortune never satisfies. It's never enough. But I've come to a peace. So check this out. When I'm 24 years old, five, six years ago, I was in California. And I never met anybody else like me. When I was 10 years old, I wish I would have met somebody like me never did didn't get that miracle but at 24 in california saw a little boy with no arms and no legs 19 months old just like me i knew he was going to be bullied i knew he was going to go through depression i knew he would feel alone i knew that he would get worried if he's ever going to have a girlfriend and so on and so on i got the father to bring him up on stage in front of 2000 people And everyone was crying. And it was a materialization of when you don't get a miracle, you can be a miracle for someone else. I am not a superhero. I go through ups and downs. So do you. But take one day at a time. And if you haven't found that peace of knowing who you are and why you're here and where you're going when you're not here, for me, I want you to know that's how I've overcome. I don't have any walls. My book's called Life Without Limits. And what will be, will be. I've acted in a short film, 30 awards. I got best actor in a short film. I've done my own music video. I've written two books. First book, 30 languages, 800,000 copies. I'm 29, and we know a billion people know who I am. Not to bring up my pride or my name or my status. Trust me, I'm just like you. But I hope you are inspired to know that if I can dream big, then so can you. There are no walls. Find your peace and you'll make your walls doors. Thank you so much. Ah, Kim's there with us. Good, good. So uh, we'll hear some questions after the, the, the next talk, but uh, Jim, can you unmute yourself and introduce the talk and I'll play. Okay. Um, Anna, who's the, the star of the, the next TED talk, um, is, was the, well, is the, the daughter of one of my best friends who unfortunately died last year. But... <clears throat> I'm godfather to her brother, Ben, who she mentions in, in the film. And I know the family well, and I know, I've known Anna as, I do own Anna as an able-bodied person, and I do know her as a disabled person. But her story is an absolute inspiration to me, um, having met her um, you know, bo- in both conditions. So uh, please enjoy the film. Okay, we'll share again. So there I am, at the start, at Sochi. Conditions have been so bad that some of the best athletes have pulled out of the Olympics. The skier ahead of me is airlifted off course. It's my last chance. I'm determined to give it everything. Take a deep breath 
and push hard out of the start. Hi, everyone. Well, that was two years ago and marks the end of an incredible journey. When I was last at Bristol, it was 15 years ago, and I was studying sociology and snowboarding for the university snowboard team. I'm now a double Paralympian in one of the fastest and most dangerous Paralympic sports, alpine skiing. My favorite discipline is downhill. That's the fastest, where you find yourself racing down steep, icy slopes at 70 miles an hour on this. This is a monoski. As Paralympians, we raced in all the same disciplines as the able-bodied racers and down the same hills. But I haven't always been a wheelchair user. It all began in um, about 98, when I was a student here, my brother suggested that I could be good at border cross racing. You may have seen that on the TV. That's when four athletes race down a course with big jumps and bank turns on their snowboards. So, despite having never spoken with a coach or snowboarded down a border cross course, I decided to enter the British National Championships. <laughs> and surprised myself by finishing in the time trial less than a second behind the favourite. Disappointingly, I crashed out of the race, so I left with neither British ranking nor medal. However, I gained something more powerful. I realised I had potential. The seed of my Olympic dream was sown. However, I only shared that dream with brother Ben, my parents had other ideas and suggested I used my hard-earned degree to get a real job. <coughs> I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I knew I needed to earn money and I wanted an adventure. So, armed with a teaching qualification, I set out for Japan. Fascinated by the culture, learning the language, I, I was out dancing, I was having the time of my life. I spent my time snowboarding, when I wasn't working, and the dream of racing si simmered away. And then I heard about a local border cross competition. And I thought, if I can win this, then I could write to companies, I could get sponsorship to fund my race training. I only told Ben that I was racing in the, in the race. And Ben's advice, was to push hard out the start, pick up maximum speed, and just try and get out in front as soon as possible. It was a grey, cloudy day. The snow was hard, icy. The jumps big from me to, to the edge of the stage, 30 foot. I lined up with the Japanese girls, ready to race. I had to, had to give it my all. I was determined to do everything I could to win. So, shot out the start, over the first bumps, round the first corner, it was going well. Landed the first jump in the lead, carried on round the corners, over the next jump, and it was all going well. I carried on, and I hit the, hit the jump after that at high speed, and landed with a bit of a wobble, and then I felt a bit off balance. I just remember the turns coming up too quickly, and um, clung on round the, round the bank turns, hit the next jump, and then had a monumental crash. I don't remember the impact. I woke up, opened my eyes, and all I saw was my friend looking down anxiously at me, and I knew something wasn't right. My legs felt really heavy. I said to her, will you take my snowboard off? And she said, we already have. Then I had a horrendous ambulance drive. I wanted to punch the ambulance, the driver. Um, it hurt so much going around the corners. And the next thing I recall is waking up in hospital and Dr. Ito looking down at me and explaining that he'd operated to, to fix my broken thoracic spine 
And he said, I predict you have about 98% chance that you'll never walk again. It was very painful. But worse than any physical pain was looking down at my legs, which refused to move. I knew I faced life in a wheelchair. And I, I've never felt so scared, so helpless. I, I just couldn't see a positive future. How could this be happening to me? Would I ever dance again, love again? And the thought that I would never snowboard again broke me into, I couldn't imagine how I would be able to have fun. And then a friend came to visit me and he showed me this picture. Doesn't that look awesome? <laughs> and that's when everything changed. He arranged for me to speak to the former Paralympian in the photo, and the guy explained to me how it felt to ride downhill on this mono ski. And I started to imagine sliding in the snow and how incredibly liberating it might feel. I knew it would be fun, and I said, I'm going to try that. The doctor said, not for a year, you're not. <laughs> so when I was fit enough to be repatriated, Dr. Rito said goodbye to me, waved, and said, I'll see you in the Paralympics. <laughs> I then spent four very long and difficult months in Stoke Mandeville. Oh, really tough times. But having this picture at the end of my bed lifted me when times were really tough. It wasn't easy. My, the first time my brothers came to visit me, all we did was laugh uncontrollably all evening. <laughs> That's what I remember, because there was so much emotion to let out somehow. They loved the idea that I was going <coughs> to ride in a monoski. My mum, understandably, not so much. <coughs> I moved home. And thanks to mum's dogged determination to help me with daily physio exercises, I regained some movement in my legs, astonishing the doctors. But it, it wasn't easy. I felt trapped in a body that wasn't mine. One day, I got so frustrated that I hurled a glass of water at the wall in my mum's living room. Dad's advice was to get a job. So I volunteered in the local school. I started trying new sports. My confidence in my new identity grew. I then met Pete, the wonderful man who became my husband. And then I spent the anniversary of my accident abroad with my older brother, Luke, learning just how difficult it is to balance on a single ski. <laughs> but I stuck at it got back up, and by the end of the week, I was loving it. I came home, I practiced as much as I could, and I was eventually um, trialled and invited to join the British Disabled Ski Team. Thank you. Um, so I was on the development squad of the GB team. I'll never forget my first camp. I was in awe. I was with Britain's best skiers. They said to me, we don't have any money, so go away and get good, which is what I did. Two years after my accident, I was in a competition for the first time, sitting in the start gate, absolutely terrified. <laughs> I had <laughs> a panic attack, I couldn't breathe. But in time, I learned to manage my own fears. I worked really hard at it. And after the first season, the coach said, Anna, I think you have the potential to get to the next Paralympics, Vancouver 2010, but you're one of the least experienced athletes on the circuit, and it's only two years away. So that's where the hard work really began. It became my sole focus. Determination, grit, resolve, I think it's like a ball of energy inside us. 
It's like a little, it's like a little ball bearing that when agitated, gets energised. You really notice it in toddlers when they really, really want something. They go red, they start to shake. It's like that <laughs> ball is burning inside them. They will do anything they can to get what they want. As adults, we all have that inside us. We've just learned to repress it. Life gets in the way. But it's a powerful force. As a team, we were up at five o'clock in the morning, stretching out on the hill for hours in all weathers, winds that will knock you over, minus 40 degrees C, where if you take your glove off, your hand is so cold it aches for, for the next half an hour. We were driven by success and by the buzz of the sport. And it was my sole focus. I did everything I could. So I got selected for the British Paralympic team four years after I got paralysed. <laughs> Unbelievable. And I was there in the British team kit, on the plane, in the Olympic village, with all the best skiers in the world. I felt a bit out of place, to be honest, but I remember sitting in the start gate. You could hear the crowds from the top of the hill. I'd never competed in front of crowds or in front of TV cameras. I felt quite sick from the fear of not, not performing, but I skied down. I managed to get to the bottom of the first of the two slalom runs. Then I phoned Ben, and he reminded me to believe in myself. I went out there, took a deep breath, pushed hard out to the start gate, and I skied the best run of my life. And as rank outsider, I finished sixth in the world. It was the most incredible experience. And I decided I was going to get to Sochi 2014, the next Paralympics. Four years after that, I'd won six World Cup medals. I'd qualified for all five disciplines in the Sochi Paralympics. I had proved that I stood a chance of a Paralympic medal. I was just outside the British qualifying criteria for the team, for the Paralympic team. But perhaps a little bit arrogant, I thought, how can they not take me? stand a good, pretty good chance, better chance than many. And then, queuing up in the airport on the way to World Cups in Canada, alongside a load of other international athletes, I was told that I hadn't been selected for the Paralympic team. My coach then avoided eye contact for the whole journey, and I refused to show that I was upset. I eventually cornered him and said, do you want to take me? And he said, Anna, the way you're skiing now, yes, I do. And I was going to do everything I could. The fight was on. So during those races, I stayed up all hours. Brother Luke and a lawyer friend helped me craft an appeal letter. Unfortunately, the, the, the appeal worked. The decision was overturned. I was on the British Paralympic team on my way to Sochi. Picture this, at the top of the Paralympic downhill. Conditions are horrendous. The snow is so soft that it's dangerous. As athletes, we want, we want the snow to be hard and icy so that the course holds up. <sighs> Helmet on, goggles on. I'm determined to give this everything I've got. I've won, or I was fastest in the first training run. I know I can win this race. I take a deep breath and push hard out of the start. And this is what happened.
34 year old from Warwick and attorney is out of the gate and on course her husband and physio Peter Walton back at home watching this so closely on the TV 0.72 is where an attorney needs to keep it 0.72 has Turney on track for bronze good job here perfect uh, perfectly on line coming on to Beersburg and absolutely no problem on the jump finds a straight line she's got time to find but she's got good speed coming down the steep here she's found a straighter line than any of the big oh! names runs very close to the nets though underestimating how quickly she was going she's done a great job of keeping herself composed it's horribly oh! rough here and turning this down. down oh that's a nasty fall on the very bumpy backside of the lake jump. They're going to have to do some work on that section of the course. Anna, though, oh, great testament to her physical conditioning. She is unhurt, pride dented somewhat, I suspect. And what a shame. She was going so, so well. Well, Turney, who was in the bronze medal position at the first split time, just gets a, a little light on the lake jump, goes down. It's very bumpy through all of these heavy sit skis, landing in the same position and creating little bumps and rollers in the snow. And once that ski's released from the sit ski, there's uh, no choice for the athlete but just to let gravity take them down the mountain. The good news is Anna Turney is unhurt. I was skiing so well, but it was crazy bumpy. 65 miles an hour to a standstill in nine seconds. Lying on the snow, utterly despondent. I picked myself up and two days later, I was racing in the Paralympic Super G on the same hill. There was a long hold because the athlete ahead of me crashed but I pushed hard out of the start, gave it all I'd got, and I got to the bottom and I was in second. <sighs> then I was knocked down into fourth place. The TV interviewer then said to me, how disappointed do you feel to have miss just missed out on a Paralympic medal? <sighs> <laughs> My media training went out the window at that point. <laughs> oh. I went up into the stands where my brother Luke gave me a massive hug and that lifted me out of the depths of despair. It made me realise that it wasn't the, actually the end of the world. My teammates won medals and I was pleased for them, but I felt like a failure. I felt angry, I, I, felt, I felt like hurting myself. I, I felt like I'd let everyone down. Back at Heathrow, waiting to go through to arrivals, all I wanted to do was hide in my husband's arms. I didn't want to see anybody for a long time. But going out into arrivals and seeing all my friends, they're waving flags and cheering. That made me realise just how proud I'd made everybody. I've had tough times. I've, I've faced some real challenges, but we all have difficulties. We all, we all have difficult moments. We have to keep moving forwards. I set my sights high, and I had wonderful support, which helped me to grasp opportunities and to turn my life around. I competed at the very top level. Looking back now, and it's taken until now, I think, well, I, I can't really believe that I pointed my ski down that hill and I had the courage to do what I did. And I realise that I actually have achieved an awful lot. I'm, I'm now a mum. So five months ago, I had Sylvie. And, um, well, that's another whole big challenge in itself. And I tell you, that girl, even at five months, really shows some determination. <laughs> I'd like to leave you with one final thought. Whatever happens, let your dreams, and we all have dreams, 
let your dreams ignite that little ball bearing of energy. Get it rolling. Because with that, you have the power to go out and achieve really incredible things. Whatever you do, push hard out the start. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you for joining us and listening to the TED Talks from Desford Interest Group. And if you'd like to join us in future for talks in person, we'll let you know uh, via Facebook and other media how to get there.